Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation featuring a nationally renowned broadcast journalist and one of the founding mothers of NPR, Susan Stomberg. Beginning in 1972, Susan served as co-host of NPR's award-winning news magazine, All Things Considered, for 14 years. She then hosted Weekend Edition Sunday and is now a special correspondent reporting on cultural issues for Morning Edition and Weekend Edition Saturday. Susan is the first woman to anchor a nationally, national nightly news program and has been inducted into the Broadcast Hall of Fame and the Radio Hall of Fame. She's even appeared in a New Yorker cartoon. <laughs> Speaking with Susan will be John Andrews, a longtime National Arts Club member and founder of the Shakespeare Guild. Following the conversation will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Susan and John. Please enjoy that conversation. Thanks. All right, Susan, it's a real delight to be talking with you again after I'm not sure how many years. It was. I don't know. Let's not name no days, please. That's right. It's really good to see you. And I haven't, we used to hang out when you lived in Washington, but now you are in a much more glamorous and probably quiet place. Santa yes. Fe. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, I was delighted to see this new book by Lisa Napoli. Uh, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki. And it's all about the history of all things considered and of national public radio in general. Yes. And this is the 50th anniversary of NPR. Am I correct about that? You are absolutely correct. I was in diapers, of course, when I began. And so was Linda, your uh, state and city and schoolmate. Exactly. Yes, we both grew up in Carlsbad. And, yes, uh, in Carlsbad. And she was my, my junior prom date in um, 19... Oh. Yes. That I didn't know. But anyway, the two of us, um, I wouldn't say we were prom days particularly, but we certainly shared an office on day one. Yes. At uh, and founding mothers is, is what I named us because we were there. Oh, so that's your title. Very good. Yeah. Love it. And, um, and so what are, the, what are the things that you, that you relish most as you think about this uh, uh, half century of, of work with uh, NPR. It's really extraordinary. I, I always knew we'd have a future and I was quite ambitious about it as many of us were from the very beginning. But I never expected at 50 uh, that we have become the institution that we are. Yes. Uh, there was always a lot of competition from the beginning <clears throat> for us. Now there's nothing. We're the last girls and men standing in terms of electronic news broadcasting. There's no competition oh. out there. Sadly, the newspapers have folded in small and large towns. So you don't right. turn them for sources of news anymore the way you did 50 years ago when we started. Right. <clears throat> Every town had at least one newspaper, usually two, sometimes three or more. My hometown of New right. York, uh, where the Arts Club is based. Uh, must have had six papers uh, it, back back in our beginning, and and uh, and television was far reduced too. It was taking news far more seriously. There were only three networks, commercial networks: ABC, CBS, and NBC. PBS was just beginning public cover uh, television. Uh, and they they did news and did it in a serious way. All of those. Because that's all the, again, that's all there was. These days, television is sort of, I don't call it news, I call it opinion nation, because everybody's just telling you 
as loudly as they can very often what they, uh, what they believe and what they feel is important. And that's just not enough. You don't get a breadth of opinion or vision that way. So there we are, my goodness. And uh, the idea of the kind of radio that National Public Radio provided, uh, that was really something that you helped invent. Am I correct about that? Sure, because there was no precedent for that either. We were first in so yes. many ways that uh, I didn't yes. realize at the time, but there was no precedent for it. Linda says it wonderfully, though. She says that we were essentially a startup. And that, right. that was a cue. I mean, that was a term that wasn't even invented 50 years yes. ago. But um, essentially, because we were so new, it was a great advantage being in a startup because you didn't have to ask anybody permission for anything. You could just come in, launch what it was you wanted to do and do it. If it flew, great. You know, you saluted. If it didn't, you discarded it and tried something else. And those great days of experimentation and, and, uh, and creativity, enormous creativity, have disappeared. Yes. And, and in part, largely because of that responsibility to the news now, because they're in, in the landscape. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm fighting a, a cold, John, and I'm droopy and drippy everywhere. So <clears throat> excuse this <laughs> stuffy nose sure. and throat clear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, it, but because of, of the, the need that we have to really hold the flag for news, it sort of pushed a lot of that creativity into much smaller space. And really, uh, it's not the impulse of the, of the program anymore. But, but where you find it is in the podcasts, the ones yes. that Lara is doing and the ones that the young people love to do, just as we did when we were young yes. and started, yes. because you could do anything. Yes. So it continues to evolve. And oh, I certainly hope so. Absolutely. Yes. Right. And I, and I gather that part of uh, the concept behind NPR was that it would be more than just a news program. Oh, absolutely, from the beginning, yes. Yes. And in fact, there's a phrase in the mission statement that was written mm -hmm. for NPR when it began by the man who inspired it all. He was our first program manager, Bill Seymour. He was the one who hired me. He hired Linda. Right. He was the one who decided I should be the, the woman Right. to do to do news. But the term in the mission statement, in addition to all these lofty goals, was that we would celebrate life. Yes. I mean, where do you see that in a mission statement for broadcasting? Yes. If it's commercial, uh, the goal is to make as much money as you possibly can and sell as many things as you can. Yes. <clears throat> Otherwise, that idea of celebration, uh, right. I think about that every day, and it's been my goal for all of these years, but I, I fear that that's long lost too. Yes. And partly because of this responsibility, partly because as difficult a time as it was, I mean, we're in the middle of, in, in the, of the Vietnamese war and there were a lot of tough things happening in the country and in the world. Still, I, when I look back on it, it just feels to me as if we were so innocent, you know, yes. so innocent that he could sit down and write that we should be celebrating life. No yes. one would do that today. They'd get a sneer right. from somebody, you know, and they'd put That's it right. aside and not be taken seriously. But I do. Well, one of the things I always loved about your reporting was that you would always find an angle that nobody else had thought of. And I remember one week when you decided that you would interview a couple, I believe in Chicago, who were starting a new restaurant. Oh. And so, so you spent all five, five days, it was a series, talking about all of the things that you had to consider in order to be successful in that. And what it finally came down to, if I recall correctly, was getting chairs that would be comfortable for 45 minutes and no longer. <laughs> like McDonald's, <laughs> like the seats at McDonald's and they'll, they'll push yes. But thank you for the compliment. That wasn't me. It was a series that maybe the, mo the most creative person who ever worked uh, on All Things Considered and NPR, Robert yes. Crouch, thought of. He also uh, yeah. used to do these vaudeville routines <laughs> in which he explained economics with yes. uh, songs and wrote operas about them. Um, exactly. And he got me doing dancing with him on the air, doing vaudeville routines to yes. his 
explanation, very serious stuff of yeah. it, none of which I ever understood, but I know I'm not a very good dancer, but we really had fun doing that. And that was it. We just had a had an impish and adorable and still does side to him. Yes. Well, I and and among other things, you were on the board of the the Penn Faulkner Poetry mm -hmm. uh, Society. It was literary. It was fiction. Uh, fiction. Or I guess it, yeah, it was fiction, wasn't it? Yes. And you helped you helped establish the Shakespeare Guild's uh, Gielgud Award for Excellence in the Dramatic Arts. Yes. You that may recall, I think it was in um, April of 1994, when you and Robert McNeil and Tony Randall uh, I uh, helped uh, create this uh, this honor, and you read the letter from Sir John, uh, basically endorsing it. Oh, I'm so glad I was a part of that. Thank you for asking. Yes. What I remember most about you from those days is you let me, you took me down to the vault. Is that what it's called at the folder? That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you let me handle a first folio. I think you had more. You have more there at the folder are more first folios or folios than anyone outside of Britain, correct? Uh, more than anyone in Britain either. Oh. In, uh, yeah. There are about, I think, 230 copies remaining of that book. Yeah. And 80 of them are on Capitol Hill at the Folger Shakespeare Library. So yeah. on Capitol Hill, it's, absolutely. It's a phenomenal so, number. Is yes. a, as an English, former English major, that was right. real to be able to be down there and holding that. And I even that, did a story about that once. I got back in that vault and I brought with me some young actors and asked yes. them to do different uh, passages. And they just walking in there and holding it reacted yes. just the way I did. They said, oh, this is the Holy Grail and I have this in my hands. They were so cute. Yes, yes, yeah. And uh, when... Um, and I've, if I recall correctly, when uh, Kenneth Branagh did his film of Hamlet, yeah. um, this was an event that took place at the Smithsonian to launch that. Oh. And you interviewed uh, Ken. I was thrilled to be uh, asked to talk with Mr. Branagh to me. I don't know from Kenneth, yes. but I don't, I don't ken him. And so I called him, I can't remember what I called him, but I was polite. And he yes. Sensational. Oh, yes. here's what I remember about. I remember nothing that was said, nothing that was asked or answered, but I, I remember how attractive he was. And the backstage, yes. wherever we were, was a big mirror in, again, in a Florida mid wall. And he stood in not a bit of a vain way in front of it before we went on the stage. And he just adjusted his sweater and his collar, and, you know, made sure his hair was right. And then it was time for us to go out on the stage. And I guess because he's a gentleman, he motioned for me to go first. I felt he should have, but I wasn't gonna fight with him back there. So I got out there first and out he came. And John, I've never heard applause thunder the way it did. It was so loud for him that you could yes. feel, I felt it on my body. It was yes. So massive. People were so delighted to see him. So yes. that, wait a minute, we've got some Hamlet stories too, as long as yes. it's... I want to hear a Hamlet story. Tell me a Hamlet story. <laughs> okay. But you have a good one because we did something about to be or not to be, did we not on the radio? Yes. What, me what, had, what had happened was that I I was um, I had done an edition of the complete works, as it turned out, the almost complete works of Shakespeare. And uh, a friend of mine, Michael Toledo, was using my edition of Hamlet to direct a production of the play at uh, St. Mary's College in, in Maryland. Oh, yeah. And he called one morning and asked me if I was sitting down. And uh, I had a feeling that might not be a good sign. And uh, <laughs> he then asked me to pick up my edition of the play and uh, look at the most famous passage in the play and see if I noticed anything peculiar. I did, and I didn't notice anything peculiar. He then pointed out that it was missing one word, the word not. Oh, no. 
yes. <laughs> so it was to be or to be. Exactly, to be <laughs> or to be. And uh, and when you heard about it, you insisted that I come on and embarrass myself to all the world. Of by course. Telling yes, <laughs> and uh, so if I recall, I explained that uh, we we all regard Hamlet as the thinking man's hero. And I pointed out that in the Gill Shakespeare edition, he is the positive thinking man's hero. <laughs> that was a very nice cover. But I bet that any time you saw any edition of, the, of that uh, play again, and you look to see if the knot wasn't there, and if it wasn't, you put in a little carrot. You <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> you did that. Yeah. Well, That's right. Him, now, your play. son, Josh, is an actor, and he yes. has played Hamlet, right? So this is what I have to tell you. Um, yes. He's an actor. Not only that, he's a working actor, which is, is yes. not a, uh, what's the word? All I can think of now is an A jobbing actor? Yes. It's what? Yeah. No, it's not a, what's that, contradiction in terms. Oh, it's escaping my mind. Someone will write to us and tell us. Okay. Um, <laughs> So he, uh, and he was recording some uh, plays for the BBC for use in schools. Yes. And he right. was in Hamlet. Um, uh -huh. He was Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, I don't, I don't remember that. And they had a very important British director working with them in situ because they were all together. I mean, in the days right. when you had masks and have to be separated. Uh, and they rehearsed one day and they rehearsed a second day. And in the second day, there was a rumor that something bad had happened. And uh, the director motioned to Josh and said, may I see you for a minute? And Josh thought, oh my Lord, he's going to fire me. This is bad news when they want to see you alone. Guy takes him into the office, closes the door, <laughs> and Josh looks at him and the fellow says, Josh, our Hamlet has just resigned. He's leaving the show. He got a very good offer. He's got a movie. This is what happened. Oxymoron. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you all. It was oxymoron. Uh, but I was close with Anamarpi. Anyway, yes. Josh, he says, we've lost our Hamlet. He got a movie and a good one. It was an offer he can't refuse. So we don't have a Hamlet. And I want you to be my habit. Wow. Josh, what? <laughs> but of course, uh, you don't have to know it by heart because I don't think he'd ever played it. He knows a lot of Shakespeare because he uh, began in small little black box theaters doing lots of Shakespeare, memorizing them. Mm -hmm. uh, but the director said, you'll be on book and, and uh, someone has written in, in handwriting uh, the word not in the big important speech. <laughs> No, I'm just uh, yes. Um, but I need you. And Josh said, oh, I don't know. I mean, we don't have enough rehearsal stuff. We're going to be, this is so important. We're going to be recording soon. And I really, Josh, I have full confidence in you. I know you can do it. So, you know, in the good old showbiz spirit, yes. my son sure. said, sure. okay. The director walks to the door, flings it open. Behind that closed door, the entire cast has gathered, nervously waiting to hear what was going on. And the director says, ladies and gentlemen, we have found our Hamlet. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? Oh, I love it. And they went on recorded, and they, it, there's a recording of it, which I have. I want to see it. And he does that speech very nicely. He doesn't make much of it. Which, yes. which was a wise choice because yes. it's so well known yeah. and people do wait for it. So he did yeah, it. And uh, people in the audience are reciting it with you. With when you hear it. It. And yes. so he just said it as if it were in conversation. And also he didn't have to do a British accent, which was a mercy because right. Americans doing British accents very rarely uh, yes. succeed. But they all decided that they could do whatever accent they had, and that's how it was done, which I thought was, yeah. that was terrific, too. So I'm looking. I have that album somewhere. I've got a whole of that. Listen to it again. I love that. I do, too. I remember when, when Josh was at the University of Wisconsin. Right. Okay. Uh, I think you were telling me that you and Lou uh, went out for Parents Weekend. Uh-huh. 
uh, to visit Josh. And 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 I think uh, on a Saturday morning, there was a a little uh, community um, a shopping area where, where people had uh, baked goods and so oh, yeah, forth. Yeah, it's a wonderful farmer's market around the state house in Madison. That's right. And I and I gathered that one of the vendors was was selling something that was near and dear to your heart. <laughs> I'm amazed that you remember this. But yes. I just have to back up uh, and just uh, tell the history of this because every year uh, in my broadcasting life, that makes more than 50 years because I was doing radio before there was an NPR, uh, I have given on the radio <clears throat> uh, just before Thanksgiving my mother-in-law's recipe for yes. cranberry relish, which right. is a very, <clears throat> excuse me, a very strange sounding. I say it sounds weird, but it tastes delicious. Uh, consists of different ingredients. Cranberry's fine, sugar's fine. Sour mm -hmm. cream begins to get weird. The onion that you grate is even weirder, but the pièce de ix for most people is the horseradish, which you put in at the end because it gives it a little zip. It's not your sweet grandma's right. orange and, and uh, sugar uh, uh, dressing. So, uh, and I've been giving this on the radio forever. And I'm in, at the farmer's market going around. I happen to have my tape recorder with me, which I usually do carry when I'm mm -hmm. traveling because you never know what they're from. Right. And I spot on a table a jar with this pink. I describe mine as Pepto Bismarck pink right. as of the mixture of the cranberries and the sour cream. Uh, this pink stuff in a jar with a label from the Wizard of Ooze that's not <laughs> Z, but O's, like O's. Yes. Cranberry relish. So right. I up and darn, it looks like mine. And the ingredients she lists are the same. Yes. So I go up to the woman <laughs> and I say, where'd you get this recipe? And she says, well, Susan Stambler gives it every year on the radio. And I said, I'm Susan Stambler. And she looked so uncomfortable. You know, she didn't say, oh, wow, great. She <laughs> as if I was going to sue her, you know, or, yes. <laughs> or insist. She was selling it for a dollar. I certainly would have charged more. Anyway, I had to buy a bottle, of course. Of course. I, bought, I bought a bottle yes. of the drug. I took it home. I think Not I, quite up to the... No, it, mine's better. But nonetheless, uh, I had a wonderful radio piece out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that. I love that. I did too. I'm That's glad you were it. You hosted All Things Considered for, was it 14 years? Am yeah. I correct? Long. And then you created um, Sunday Weekend Edition. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that that was probably the most brilliant concept for huh? a program. I just loved the way, for example, you were the one who, who discovered the car guys from I did. WB. I, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yes, that's another story. I can't say I discovered them, but I made the proper decision. They had yes. been in the air. This was um, uh, Tom and Ray Maliazzi, who ran right. the news garage in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where they lived. Mm -hmm. um, and they'd been on the, year, on the air together for 10 years. Oh, really? Yes, with one another. And when uh, we were putting Weekend Sunday on the air, we sent out an all call to the stations, our member stations, saying, anybody got anything that you're running locally that might work for this new morning show? And all kinds of cassettes and tapes came in. And someone brought this one. First of all, took it around. They played yes. it for the, my producer, Kitty Ferguson, and she said, oh, no, so, uh, no. That doesn't belong. This is an arts program. You know, we're yes. not going to do news. We're not going to do. We're going to do art. And then they took it to the then news director Robert Siegel, who yes. himself later became the All Things Considered host for more years than any of us. Right. I think he may be watching today. By the way. Oh, I hope so. Hi, Robert. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, by the way, I have to tell you here, if he's watching, there are several versions of this story. He has <laughs> okay. minds the best. So he'll have an opportunity for rebuttal? Oh, that? he absolutely will. Yes, oh, but as right. he has many times, in fact. <laughs> uh, he was always a very good editor, but sometimes incorrect. Okay, so 
uh, we played it for uh, Siegel Lucente. He said, I don't think so. This is no, it doesn't fit into anything. But I took it home, played it for my husband, who had lived in Cambridge, as had I for uh, some years mm-hmm. earlier. Uh, in fact, we met there. And my husband said, Susan, I don't know from what you're doing, you're having a pianist, a live piano playing on the program. You're going to have Alice Waters do recipes for you. You're having Jules Pfeiffer do movie reviews. You're going to have a crossword puzzle. Where do these guys fit in? And I said, we got to put them on the air. These yeah. guys are fabulous. That's they, right. they, everybody loves cars. They yes. have a fabulous accent. Their relationship right. is wonderful. And the way they laugh will brighten everybody's mood. Exactly. So yes. I, I insisted. And they came on for just five minutes. And then uh, the format was that I was going to join them. They didn't like this at all. Who needs, you know, they've been doing some for 10 years. They don't need some New York broad interfering with their timing and all their fun. Uh-huh. But what won their hearts, and I didn't say this for deliberately, really, I just was telling, was that I was the owner and driver of a 1974 Dodge Dart uh, with a slant six engine. I know nothing about cars, by the way. Yes. That's, you've heard what I know about it. And that, Tom couldn't believe it. That was his favorite car in the world. Really? And he said, oh, this is a wonderful person. She must be terrific. We will work with her because she's got that car. <laughs> so I used to do it with them and yes. laugh my head off. And then, of course, they uh, left that show because five minutes could not contain them. And they got their own wonderful Exactly. So you, you, you put them on the map. I did indeed. That's right. And Will Shorts, I guess he still does uh, crossword, does word puzzles. On, he does. Uh, yes, he does. Uh, and now he, he then... I called a a, a friend, uh, Richard Maltby, who is a lyricist and a Broadway director, who was doing at the time the crossword puzzle for, Mm -hmm. I think it was New York Magazine, following, oh no, it wasn't, it was The Atlantic. Yes. uh, Something else. And I said, Richard, would you do a puzzle for me? Be my puzzle person, because we're going to do this new program. He said, I can't, I'm really swamped, I've got a lot. But I'll tell you, I'll give you a good name. There's, there's such a thing called uh, something magazine, Puzzle Magazine, I guess it was. Mm-hmm. And the editor of that might be very good for you. Enter Will Shorts. Thank you, Richard. I love it. And, and Will is still there and still yes. terrific and still stumps me. But they yes. were very smart when I left. But when it went on, because I, I guess I was such a hand or we were so shorthanded, uh, I not only wanted to talk with the, car guys every week, but I also wanted to be the one who did the puzzle. And yes. so when it began, they would pose, he would pose the question and you'd hear me. Here was my answer. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> it took me forever. And yes. I guess that wasn't very interesting to anybody. <laughs> when I left, somebody on the staff had the brilliant idea of involving listeners. And making yeah. the phone calls out to listeners and let them. I was thinking that, that was something that was a part of your show, but uh, obviously I met, I uh, over misremembered it. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But <laughs> anyway, it was just such a good decision to do that, yes. and I love listening to that every time. But I don't ever hear any of those people, the the, the real people, the listeners go. Uh, 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 they don't seem no. to have the same problems that I did. Yeah, they're they're pretty good, aren't they? They are awfully good. Right. One of my favorite features of that show was the serial novel. Yes. <laughs> together with George Garrett. Could you tell us about that? I will. My goodness. You really listened carefully then, didn't you, John? That's good. I love that show. This is going back to the very beginning of that program. It went on here in 1987. And it's still, right. And mm-hmm. it's changed quite a bit, too. But uh, uh, I, I felt there was a need. Uh, it was clear there was a need to build listeners, build an audience. And a good way to do it uh, was to do a kind of soap opera. I was always interested in literature. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I thought, I know we'll just get really good writers, American writers, to write a chapter, a piece for us. And Mm -hmm. some very good ones agreed to do it. George Garrett being the first. He himself was a very lovely uh, uh, novelist. 
And he, uh, he wrote the first chapter and then handed it off to the second. I can't remember the order of them, but each writer did their very best to leave it hanging on a shelf and make yes. it as hard as they possibly could for the next off. And it yes. went on like this and on like this. It became kind of interminable. But people <laughs> listened because they wanted to hear the twists and turns. When we yeah. were done with it, a publisher called and said, uh, we might be interested in publishing that. And I said, <laughs> No, you won't. You won't be able to give it any narrative line. Nothing will be able to come out of it. It, it just will not work. But we did get one later. And again, it was thanks to Garrett. We just kept up, up the device. We did a mystery, a serial mystery. and uh, But in the end, we did the right thing, which was to get everybody to use the same phrase in a short story. And the mm -hmm. phrase came from Garrett. Uh, it was the girl, oh, it, it was the wedding cake in the middle of the road. Yes, yes. And only one, George could have come up with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And again, wonderful writers did their best with it. And, and that got published. That, that became a book uh, yes. from Norton. Uh, and a very nice one, too. And it even, it's the only book I have ever written, got translated into Japanese. 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 I felt that was a triumph. <laughs> I love that. That's I did, great. I did. Yeah. I did of course. Now, haven't you also worked with Mr. Rogers? Isn't, yes, uh, I did. Fred Rogers um, asked me to come and he did two or maybe three uh, primetime programs for uh, the parents of his audience, for grown-ups. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, different themes. One was uh, superheroes was the first one. <clears throat> uh, the second one was uh, divorce, which was really mm -hmm. the best program that we did. It was in front of an audience. I mean, they all were. Right. I, and I was, was to uh, sit on the set with them. I'd never done uh, television. And this was very, very complicated. Uh, four cameras, sit on the set with him then talk with him and his guest. He always had an expert of one sort or another. Mm -hmm. And then get up and go out into the audience and go up and down aisles holding out um, the microphone as well. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story about that, uh, which I, I find a little eerie, but also funny. I started thinking hard about this. It was going to be live television and it had to right. be out at to time, you had to get off the air yes. on time. And it was these four cameras, and I'd never done any. Uh, and, and all that busyness on the set, out in the audience, and on the telephone with listeners, and going back and forth. And I thought about it about two weeks ahead, and I panicked. And I called the producer and said, look, I'm really having great doubts about this. I'm, I want you to have the best possible uh, shows that you can and I don't feel I'm seasoned enough I'm not experienced enough really to be able to do the best that you could get so yes. I'm, I'm so afraid his name is Basil I don't remember his last name but I'm so sorry Basil I, I really I have to beg her. oh no he did everything he could to convince me but I was adamant I really and it was in their behalf as well as my own sure I was nervous yes. and concerned about it but also I I was sincere that I just wanted to, them to have the best possible uh, problem. So I hung up and I felt immensely relieved. And a few hours later, I got a phone call. And on the phone was this voice, Susan. <laughs> it was, so it was Fred Rogers himself. It was Daniel Tiger. Oh my gosh, okay. Susan, <laughs> you're afraid, aren't you? Said Daniel. And I said, I am. I'm really nervous about this, and I just feel I shouldn't do it. Oh, Susan, he said, <laughs> we'll give you all the support you need. You don't have to worry. 
And I, Danny, would be really upset if you weren't able to do this with us because you, I know, I have confidence in you and I know you didn't even go on and on. By the end, <laughs> I was practically sucking my thumb. And of course I said, okay, Daniel. <laughs> he worked his magic. I love that. And I did it. And we had a couple of glitches, but nothing really serious. They pulled me through, you know, they, yes. they cued me and they uh, told yes. me which camera to look in the But that was quite an experience, really, don't you think? I love that. And, and, and the fact that he used his primary surrogate to convince That's right. you. He yes. Daniel, because Daniel could be frightened too. And it yes. Is. Whereas Fred didn't do that much himself. Yes. Uh, you know, on his show. <clears throat> but that, I mean, it was such a, an example of his brilliance because, and his sensitivity, you know, and, the, yes. and why he was so successful with children, because he got right to the heart of my fear. And he could, got me to talk about it. And he got me to overcome it. We need that a lot, don't we? We really we need that in this world. Did you, uh, did you interview Tom Hanks when he played Fred Rogers? No, I never did. And he did a pretty How did you play. like his portrayal? Uh, it was fine, but you know, we know Fred so well. That's the point. Yes, right. You know, you know, his face and his manner and all. Right. I always saw, uh, saw the gap in it, but oh, he's a wonderful actor. I just uh, watched him. What did I see the other, uh, the other night? And, and he just knocked me out. I, I'd forgotten how terrific, how powerful he is. Oh, it was a, a, a film I'd never seen, an old one called The Terminal. Mm -hmm. And he's trapped uh, in an air airport uh, for weeks and weeks because he doesn't have a visa, he doesn't have a passport, he doesn't have the right papers, so the United States won't let him in. And he just, he, he had no, almost no dialogue. Mm -hmm. And it was only his facial expressions and his body, the way he used his body. Yeah. It was fabulous. I must say, John, that since my son, my son has started acting, I really notice I'm looking at actors in a different way. And yes. In a different way. I'm learning so much from Josh. That's very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. It's yeah. good. Yes. So is there anything you haven't done that <laughs> you would like to do? Um, <laughs> are there any unfulfilled aspirations? Uh, well, I always wanted to be a jazz singer sitting on a piano in a red dress with a slit up the side. And now I've lost my voice. There was a time, when, there was a time uh, when at least I could carry a tune. That's gone. Uh, yes. So I, I'll never realize that one. But you know what? It's funny because the first thing that occurred to me while you were speaking was, was also musical. I, and this has never occurred to me before. I would love to conduct an orchestra. Uh, I guess uh, it's the right. bossiness in me, huh? <laughs> and do you, do you have a particular orchestra? I think I think you're cut out for this. Uh, which orchestra would you like to conduct? Boston well, it has to be a big one and a good one, like Chicago Symphony. You know, absolutely. Yes. Classical music, <laughs> not so much. Okay, well, I think your audition has now been completed. So <laughs> oh, good, <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what it was like to work with Nina and Linda and Koki, you yeah. know, your, your compadres? Yeah. Uh, just extraordinary women. I think of them all, I know Linda the best because we started at the same time and we were office mates. But those three were really out in the field a lot. In fact, spent their working lives in the field on beats. I never was. I was always in the studio all day long, recording interviews, being right. on the air, anchoring the program. So uh, we didn't have so much professional relationships as we did um, gender ones. That yes. is, we were women in a field where we were firsts in many ways. I was the first to anchor a news broadcast. Linda was the first to broadcast from the uh, from the floor of the of the U.S. Congress, right? You know, was the first to uh, to get these in scoop after scoop after scoop, incredible, right. particularly uh, Anita Hill's stories about exactly. yes. Clarence Thomas, Thomas during the Thomas uh, investigations. 
So, uh, and their, their work was terrific, but the fact that we were women and, and pioneering is the thing that really brought us together. And also reaching out not only to one another, but yeah. to other women down the line and bringing them in and, and mentoring them and monitoring them and helping them as best we could yes. forever. Koki was terrific at that. She really was the best at it. But, mm. And she was a role model for us for so many things. Yes. To this day, uh, I will say to myself and the others uh, have told me they do this too. I will say in a tough situation, what would Koki do? And she yeah. always knew the right thing to do. Very right thing to say. Yeah. I remember on one occasion um, uh, being in the studio when, when you were doing a program, and I was looking at a little rack that had little video, little audio cassettes. Uh -huh. And I believe they were called buttons. Am I correct? Yes, yeah, buttons. These are the little segues between segments. Yes. And the one I liked best was entitled Cheap Trills. <laughs> <laughs> Who well, was on it, I wonder? Yes. So who, who came up with this idea as a, as a way of kind of holding the program together? <laughs> oh, that was tissue. definitely. Oh, it was out of desperation. In fact, the first and most used button in our very first months was one called the panic button. The panic button. Okay. <laughs> and Linda, who was our <laughs> first director, not for long, but for disasters, yes. for her terrible pain. It was so hard. Nobody knew what to do and nobody knew what, I mean, you'd go on the air and you didn't have a single piece of tape to, to broadcast. Uh, and so that was at the time that you put in the panic button <laughs> into the yes. machine. Uh -huh. and a little ditty or two, bought time while you yeah. figured out, you know, she yelled down a hole, what the heck is going on here? Give me some story. So the panic button got a lot of love. But uh -huh. also I just, uh, I love hearing them. Uh, those little interludes are really important to change a mood or yes. sustain a mood. That was so extraordinary uh, with Steph Scajari, who's the pianist on Weekend Sun Sunday. I could say to him, Steph, I need to go from a very serious story to a much lighter one. Right. Uh, and it's got to be 32 seconds long. <laughs> and wow. he said, okay. And he just, no practice, nothing. The time came, we got the cue, he just did it. That was what uh, how brilliant he was at that. But yes. well, you know, I, I just think, uh, and, and the name for the show, All Things Considered, yes. how could you do better than that? Who came up with that? It's fabulous. There was a, uh, a staff contest, and right. you taught me radio. A man named yes. George Giese, who was uh, the NPR's operations manager, but I worked for him in my first radio job <laughs> at our local public radio station, which was brand new, just going on the air, WAMU in Washington, D.C. And yes. never set foot in a radio place, but uh, knowing that it was the medium of my childhood and the glamour medium that I'd ever known mm -hmm. and loved, I, I nagged him to pieces for a job. I called him every week forever. And I think he got so tired of me making phone calls that he said, sure, I'll hire you. And he did. But then he yes. taught me everything. He taught me everything. Yes. So I'm eternally grateful to him. And he won the contest, all yes. considered. And it's a, it really is a good name, isn't it? It's a wonderful, wonderful time. I, I remember when, uh, when you extended the program from 90 minutes to 120 minutes by repeating the first segment at the end. Yeah. Uh, I, I told Linda that I really thought it was time to rename the program, All Things Considered and a Few Things Reconsidered. <laughs> That's good. Well, now we do a full she two said, hours. She said it needed work. <laughs> it does. <laughs> but we do a full two hours, and sometimes we don't have any, we need more time than this. Yes. But, but uh, my favorite name story is uh, from when Morning Edition went on the air. And again, there was a staff contest. <clears throat> I couldn't come up yes. with anything. And I didn't like Edition because that was so newspaper-y. We were not a newspaper. It needed yes. to be oral. Uh, but Jay Kernis, who ended up being the producer of that program, had a great name for it. It was, Tomorrow We'll Be Better. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's great. That's great. Actually, nobody ever chose that. Yes. 
Well, I think Nadine has been collecting a few questions from uh -huh. our viewers. I think from Siegel. And let's let's see if anybody has any 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 really brilliant uh, uh, okay. ideas about ways to stump the panel. Nadine, <laughs> wait, I'm the panel. I don't like stumping. <laughs> Well, our audience certainly has a lot of ideas of what you can do in your free time. Oh. Um, <laughs> so Paul is wondering if there's any chance of seeing you act in live theater. Oh, my gosh. Well, uh, wow, that, that's a nice suggestion. Uh, no. <laughs> you know, I have no memory. I have no memory anymore. It's Swiss cheese. But what I'm remembering is an interview I did with Mary Martin, who was getting on in years. And she had a, wore a tape recorder somewhere on her and an earpiece that was uh, hidden. And she had her lines fed to her. She heard herself coming back to her the whole show. Yes. So I could probably do that, but I know <laughs> me. I keep saying, oh, be quiet. <laughs> 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 but I love that suggestion. Thank you. No, I wonder if it's time for somebody to play you and oh, do yeah. it. I, 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 do you have any idea who you would cast for? Well, many years ago, I, ca I did cast the movie for, uh, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> for all those who did it. And I then was played by Anne Bancroft, you know. Not but, bad. Uh, Not yeah. bad. Yes. But, uh, and Linda was Catherine Hepburn because she wore her hair that way. In those yes. Days. All right. And, and uh, let me think who else was around. Uh, it wouldn't mean, I don't think it would mean anything to any, any of our viewers now that, yes, I cast it then. I was very busy. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. Nadine? Well, another question, again, for your free time. Paula is wondering, don't you want to throw the first ball at a Yankees game at <laughs> Yankee Stadium? No, I would let Bob Edwards do that. I gave up baseball once when the Dodgers left Brooklyn. I just stopped following baseball. I was so mad. I'm so you were an Evans Field fan. Yeah, say it again. You, so you would have, if you had a chance to throw out the first ball in Ebbets Field, you would have done that. Oh, sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Uh, a question from Lisa. Do you think today's on-air hosts at NPR get as involved in conceiving show concepts and bringing them to life as you were able to? And if not, what do you think has changed? That's a wonderful question. Uh, I can't answer uh, uh, personally because I don't go to the editorial meetings anymore. That's the time when you come in, uh, each staff, each program staff comes in and pitches their ideas for what to do today or tomorrow or later. And the hosts come in with lists of they did come in with lists of stuff that they wanted to do. I don't know. I don't know what the dynamics of that were. And uh, I, I feel that the hosts don't have to do that anymore because we have these incredible, incredibly talented and smart people on staff. We had great young people on our staff in the early days, but there were so few of them that uh, everybody just desperate, you know, they took any host idea that, that we threw at them. And again, that's Linda's idea of startup. I mean, we could do that. And, uh, and so you could be experimental and goofy and all of that. Um, today, uh, I, I think to answer that uh, second part, uh, it's what I was saying before that uh, the responsibility has so changed and it really does change the dynamic of the program itself. It's not to say that it's dull, but it's not nearly as crazily invented, inventive as it was once. You know, in one hot summer day, I'm remembering, and this was around 1983, my uh, partner Noah Adams and I uh, realized it was an extremely hot day in Washington, DC. And we thought we'd go out on the sidewalk with our tape recorder and see whether in fact it was so hot that you could fry an egg on the side. Uh -huh. We went and did that. No one would dream of doing that today. <laughs> it would be just so goofy. But we needed to fill time. We wanted to have a little fun. We wanted to get out of the building. 
Uh, and the answer is no, you can't really. <laughs> it was very hot, but n that egg never curdled. And is, is, that sounds like a David Letterman. Uh, well, it is. It's like his yes. tricks. We, we would do that. Just come yes. up with goofy ideas and be able to do them. No, yes. they wouldn't. I don't think they'd be as goofy because they're more serious people. And, <laughs> and they probably, there'd be a lot of protest <laughs> if it were raised. Yes. So. I love it. And maybe by listening. So live to experimentation it, took place on ATC. Then. A lot of it did. A lot yes. Of, and that was just so much fun. It was fun to do. Yes. But our hosts maybe. are wonderful. They are, the people are here on the air especially Rachel Martin. She's, uh, she's my major favorite. I just think she's got everything that you need to be a great broadcaster and she does it. Yes, wonderful. Nadine? A uh, question from another viewer. Did you know you were pioneering when you were pioneering? <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess I did. I mean, I certainly realized uh, uh, when I began hosting and that whole notion of being the first woman uh, really just set a, a very high bar. I knew that I, I ended up, of course, working harder than anybody else because I knew I had to. And I wasn't just doing it for me, but I was doing it for all womankind. That is, there needed to be, I, I didn't want to be the only one. And I wanted others to follow. And just look now at the broadcast world, how it's populated by women. Terrific ones, so-so ones. I mean, there can be so-so ones too now. That's how big the field is, you know, and a handful of great ones out there as well. So I guess I knew that. I certainly knew that we were doing something I had never heard before. And, and to that extent, we were, we were pioneering. Um, so yeah, and it felt really good. Very nice. Nadine? Yeah, no, I think that's a really nice way to end the Q&A portion. Um, thank you so much to John and Susan for this truly wonderful conversation. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, and please join us again for upcoming National Arts Club programs. You can find out more at nationalartsclub.org. And I'm going to turn it back over to John to really close out the evening. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And Susan, I don't think we managed to consider all things, but we managed to consider quite a few. Quite a number, indeed. Thanks, exactly. John, for inviting me. It was it's been real a real treat. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Bye now. Bye-bye.